these photos actually show Noah's Ark, then they can prove that everything that's written in the Bible about this whole event is actually true, right? This is a historical event that actually happened. First on Fox, a biblical story is getting new life. In the snowy peaks of eastern Turkey, a bold team embarked on a quest to uncover Noah's Ark from the Great Flood. Armed with cutting-edge technology and unwavering resolve, they succeeded. They found the remarkable man-made structure dating back 4,800 years. But will this evidence be accepted by the scientists? Can an ancient wooden relic authenticate biblical tales? Join us as we unravel the discovery of Noah's Ark. The discovery of Noah's Ark remains on Mount Ararat. It was an exciting yet freezing day in eastern Turkey as the dedicated explorer team prepared for their mountain expedition. This passionate group of Ark enthusiasts had been searching the icy slopes of Mount Ararat for years, determined to find evidence of Noah's legendary ship from the Bible. The crew was led by Dr. Fatih Ahmed Yuksel, an archeologist who had been obsessed with uncovering Noah's Ark ever since he was a young boy, listening to stories about the famous biblical boat. Yuxel assembled a skilled team of researchers, archeology span students, expert climbers, photographers, and technical experts. He equipped them with advanced cameras, mapping equipment, and specially designed ground penetrating radar arrays. I just know if we meticulously scan every inch of the terrain, we'll discover something incredible, Yuxel enthusiastically told his cohort as they planned the search. He was convinced that if Noah's Ark existed, it had to be preserved somewhere up on the freezing, wind-battered peaks. The hardy team spent days hiking up the snow-covered slopes, braving thin air, battered winds, and frigid nights camping as they searched for clues. Finally, they arrived at the Durupinar site on the Tendurik mountain range. Local tradition held that this was the final resting place of the biblical ship, stuck fast in the mountains of Ararat after the Great Flood ended. As the crew carefully surveyed the hilly terrain, researcher Andrew Jones noticed something sticking out of the snow. He called to Yuxel, asking if she saw that shape over there, noting its symmetrical appearance with clear straight lines. They rushed over to the site with great anticipation. Large darkened timbers arranged in distinct straight lines and right angles protruded from the deep snow drifts, too regular to be a natural formation. They wondered, could this be what they were thinking? Yuxel and Jones rapidly deployed their ground penetrating radar scanners while the rest of the team watched eagerly over their shoulders. As the radar maps generated, they revealed an enormous structured mass buried under the snow and volcanic debris. Yuxel stared at the cascading waterfall of frozen timbers on his scanner, his mind racing. Jones exclaimed that it was approximately the perfect size described in the Book of Genesis. With separate internal compartments and everything, the construction is processed lumber and metal. The team cheered jubilantly, high-fiving and celebrating as their cameras snapped wild photos of each other. After years of determination and effort, had they discovered the remains of Noah's legendary ark, Yuxel and Jones rushed to spread the word, contacting local Turkish museums and British media outlets to reveal their remarkable discovery. Yuxel excitedly told reporters that the formation simply wasn't natural, that it perfectly matched a massive, compartmentalized, ancient wooden marine vessel. It could well be Noah's Ark itself. Meanwhile, the crew carefully extracted fragments of the timbers and metal components from the snow to send for laboratory analysis. Radiocarbon dating of the materials yielded staggering results. The wood and metal relics were approximately 4,800 years old. This meant the giant ark remnants they had uncovered high on Mount Ararat could have plausibly been constructed and utilized by Noah himself. Right around the commonly accepted timeline for the Great Flood between 5000 and 3000 BC, Yuxel told his excited team that it aligned flawlessly with the biblical chronology and that the pieces constituted the first real physical evidence that Noah's ship in the flood truly existed, just like scripture described. The electrifying news quickly spread across the globe, making international headlines and stirring intense debate. While many Christian organizations celebrated the discovery as proof that biblical history was real, skeptical scientists had their doubts. The famous evolutionary biologist Dr. William Denvers, in a heated television interview, 
argued that simply finding old wood on a mountain does not constitute definitive proof of anything. While the results were promising, the world awaited more concrete evidence from Yuxel's team to validate such an extraordinary claim. Regardless, Dr. Yuxel and researcher Jones were thrilled they could potentially unravel at least a portion of the centuries-old mystery surrounding the existence of Noah's Ark. Further study of the surprising organic artifacts extracted from the frigid depths of Mount Ararat may indeed reinforce the hypothesis that these remains originate from the fabled biblical lifeboat itself. For now, the tireless explorers kept the precise location of their precious discovery completely confidential. But they continued conducting additional high-tech analyses, preparing to shock the world with more revelations that could rewrite accepted biblical history forever. A stunning announcement of a possible discovery of Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat ignites a fiery debate between religious believers and the scientific community, leaving the world waiting on definitive proof to settle arguments and reshape history. Keep watching. Hot debate over legitimacy of the discovered Noah's Ark. As soon as Dr. Yuxel and Andrew Jones publicly announced their alleged discovery of Noah's Ark remains on Mount Ararat, it became the top story in news outlets across the globe. While many in the religious community celebrated it as tangible evidence that major events in the Old Testament truly occurred, the scientific community approached the claim with high skepticism. A fiery debate rapidly erupted between Bible scholars, archaeologists, geologists, historians, and evolutionary scientists regarding the legitimacy of the findings and what they meant for established history if proven accurate. Excited biblical experts like Dr. Raymond Johns from Yale Divinity School expressed stunned reactions. This could be archeological proof that key scripture stories like the flood in Noah actually happened, Johns declared passionately on a CNN special panel. If the wood relics carbon dates to the timeline stated in Genesis, it powerfully validates the historical accuracy of the Bible. Many Christian churches use the tantalizing possibility of the Ark's discovery in their sermons and teachings. Pastor Frank from a small town congregation in Oklahoma preached, the fact we can now see and touch pieces of God's actual covenant with Noah vindicates our unwavering faith in Holy Scripture. Groups like God Evidence Archaeology raised money to send more Christian exploration teams to comb Mount Ararat in light of the bombshell revelation. On the other side, skeptical geologists pointed to long-settled evidence in the Earth's geological record. Professor Martin Stokes, head of UC Berkeley's archaeology department, flatly stated on MSNBC that the planet's landscape simply does not show evidence of a worldwide cataclysmic flood a few thousand years ago. Even if they've found an old boat structure that doesn't topple the accepted chronology of human civilization built from centuries of research, some scientists even accused the explorers of fabricating or staging the entire discovery for publicity and money rather than basing their conclusions on careful scientific analysis. This skepticism was echoed by Islamic clerics in Turkey who believed Noah's Ark crashed elsewhere. An exasperated Turkish imam told reporters that it is religious foolishness to keep searching Mount Ararat and ignore the holy site where News Ark landed as indicated by the prophet. He said that these alleged findings fail to sway their faithful who know the real shrine location. Leading evolutionary scientists also weighed in. Famed paleoanthropologist, Dr. Melanie Chang, tweeted that one anomalous mountain wood structure does not invalidate evolutionary science or our migration records built from millennia of fossils and DNA. The heated arguments went viral on major social platforms. Both sides hurled evidence and counterpoints back and forth, often talking past each other rather than engaging in constructive dialogue. Even by using the latest technology, how can they reliably date the wood that old? Questioned geology professors. Bible defenders retorted that they were just scared this would disprove the theory of evolution. Scientists called for independent peer review of methodology while believers demanded they should stop suppressing the truth our faith has held for centuries. After all the arguments, Dr. Yuxel finally agreed to lead several respected neutral evaluators to the secret site to inspect the Ark remnants firsthand and provide their assessments. The waiting world held its breath for the decisive results. Had Yuxel actually achieved the impossible and found Noah's elusive vessel frozen atop Turkey's infamous mountain? 
Or was it an elaborate ruse about to be exposed? In the middle stood figurative historian Dr. Alice Ung, torn between conflicting personal beliefs. She journaled while awaiting the final verdict that her faith tells her the Bible is true, but her career is built on establishing verified timelines of ancient peoples. Yet as a woman of God, she said she has prayed to see his wonders revealed in her time. Like Dr. Ang, people on both sides felt uncertain whether to hope the controversial discovery was proven or debunked. While the fierce debate carried on, Yuxil's Ark remnants continued undergoing analysis at classified laboratories, with the world hanging onto each emerging detail. Some complained no evidence would ever be enough to persuade the opposition. Others argued that something of this magnitude required extensive consideration before concluding. But the vast majority watched the unprecedented news unfold with open curiosity rather than fixed judgments. Could these puzzling organic artifacts truly reshape religious doctrine, scientific theory, and the accepted chronology of human origins? Or would the controversial discovery fade into disappointed obscurity like the many failed expeditions before it? Until final confirmation came, the raging debate persisted. When radiocarbon dating reveals the massive wooden structure on Mount Ararat originates precisely around the timeline of Noah's Ark and biblical lore, it ignites shockwaves and sparks arguments between religious groups now convinced of historical accuracy versus skeptical scientists clinging to old theories. Let's see how they got convinced. The radiocarbon dating and flood timeline implications. When Dr. Yuxel and Andrew Jones revealed the stunning discovery of the massive wooden structure, remarkably similar to Noah's Ark's biblical descriptions, the entire world was captivated. If proven authentic, such a finding could rewrite history and canon. But for religious and scientific acceptance, the remnants required rigorous verification beyond a reasonable doubt. The first crucial validation test came when Yuxel transported carefully extracted fragments of the ancient wooden beams and other organic materials to certified radiocarbon dating laboratories under strict confidentiality agreements. This analysis would determine the component's age by measuring residual carbon-14 isotope levels with higher precision results than previously possible. After tense weeks of waiting, the lab results sent shockwaves across the globe. Based on the carbon decay signatures within the organic samples, the wood and other materials were dated to approximately 4,800 years old. According to these analytics, the giant weathered timbers originated from around 2 through 800 BC, plus or minus several generations for error margins. Yuxil revealed reverently during an explosive televised interview that these timbers predate even the oldest structures known, and the flood timeline stated in scripture was between 5,000 and 3,000 BC. That overlap is too compelling to dismiss. In other words, the carbon-dated wreckage found high on Mount Ararat could have plausibly been built and sealed by Noah himself around the traditional date ranges associated with the Great Flood Cataclysm. Biblical scholars were stunned at the implications. Dr. William Jennings, a prominent Old Testament professor, affirmed that if the laboratory carbon measurements are accurate, then these organic remains definitively place the origins of the structure smack during the narrow window that Genesis cites a worldwide disaster occurred. The coincidence is astounding. Like Dr. Jennings, theologians raced to re-examine Genesis passages describing Noah's vessel dimensions and materials as the lab results gained acceptance in religious circles. Could this scientifically validated discovery mean all the biblical history tied to the Ark, even the Great Flood itself, were actual records rather than metaphors? Across churches worldwide, pastors passionately reinforced to their congregations that science and carbon dating now demonstrate their scriptural teachings to be historically true. Of course, several skeptical scientists pushed back against the dating methodology and conclusions. The lead geologist who had dismissed the initial Mount Ararat structure findings argued that he needed more proof the samples weren't contaminated. Establishing accurate carbon decay curves over millennia is still more art than science. He demanded a review of the entire analysis process for procedural gaps. Others reluctantly accepted the carbon dating accuracy itself, but still rejected the implications. A cluster of anthropologists wrote in Times Magazine that so they found old wood, but that alone does not definitively prove this structure is Noah's mythic vessel described in the Bible. 
nor does it confirm legendary accounts of a global deluge. These experts clung to long-held records of gradual Stone Age societal development. A particularly vocal university biologist even loses his tenure for repeatedly blasting his colleagues in journals, writing that, it is ludicrous. His scientific community accepts these carbon dating results as valid when his career is built on gradual speciation models. Passions around the stunning revelations ran deep, with careers and reputations at stake. As fiery arguments raged on in academia and the media over the radiocarbon findings, Yuxil's team tried to maintain neutrality. The lead archaeologist responded when accused of religious motivation, saying they make no claims on what this all means, only that they discovered an anomaly begging further investigation using best practices. Still, Jones quietly admitted to chaplains that lab date alignments with flood chronology certainly surprised them. What mattered most was that the calibrated carbon dating had enabled the seemingly impossible by narrowing down the age of the mind-blowing Mount Ararat structure to precisely the biblical era of Noah's Ark itself. Whether wholesale acceptance of the results flowed rapidly or reluctantly, radiocarbon analytics brought global attention from faith circles and academia. The quest for definitive answers had only just started. When Dr. Yuxo reveals finding Noah's Ark remnants on Mount Ararat but refuses to disclose their coordinates, it sets off a fiery clash between impassioned biblical defenders shouting proof of scripture confirmed versus dubious academics, branding it inconclusive as the world waits on tenterhooks for the secret location. Debate over the secret location of the Ark's resting place. When Dr. Yuxil and Andrew Jones revealed their astonishing discovery of Noah's Ark remains on Mount Ararat, the world desperately sought more details. But the explorers guarded the precise coordinates of where they had detected the massive artifact emerging from glacial debris. They feared a rush of unqualified visitors could damage the site. Still, speculation exploded over whether they had truly pinpointed the legendary vessel's landing spot from Genesis and by extension, confirmed the flood epic itself. According to the book of Genesis, after rain ceaselessly drenched the earth for 40 days and nights, the raging flood waters gradually receded to expose dry peak tops where Noah's massive ark ran aground on the mountains of Ararat. While the exact resting place remained hidden for centuries, a body of tradition gradually settled on Turkey's Mount Ararat itself, the tallest peak in the entire Ararat range within ancient Urartu kingdom borders. When Yuxil referenced detecting an enormous arc-like form on Mount Ararat, millions connected the dots. This supported nearly two millennia of beliefs that the biblical mountain must have been the scriptural vessel's final resting place. Leading Old Testament scholar, Father Etheridge, expressed on his popular podcast that by actually discovering Noah's ship wedged on remote Mount Ararat, just as always believed, it powerfully roots Christian doctrine in demonstrable historical truth. Across Sunday sermons worldwide, pastors reinforced to nodding congregations that this wonderful news should strengthen their faith. Experts located Noah's lost ark precisely where their teachings place it. Even the conservative theological society that once revoked Yuxel's membership for exploring evolution theories swung full circle to praise him, stating that they have brought honor to them all before God. Contrary experts in biblical archeology span and geography were quick to temper expectations by pointing out that Genesis never explicitly identifies Mount Ararat. Instead, the book states the Ark landed on the mountains of Ararat, referring to the broad ancient Urartu kingdom locale riddled with dozens of peaks. They lectured, emphasizing that finding old wood on one mountain in eastern Turkey does not necessarily equate to Noah's biblical site. Skeptical scholars like religious history, Professor Dr. Isaiah Dunn went further writing an online article entitled, Why the Discovery Proves Nothing, in which he explained that since early Hebrew texts used the word Ararat, broadly to reference kingdoms or regions, the vessel could have plausibly come to rest on completely different slopes hundreds of miles apart from the modern mountain. Such credible dissent kept debates raging. Meanwhile, believing explorers hit back against academics, arguing that where else would the mountains of Ararat possibly indicate if not the highest, most prominent peak itself? Jones even mused in confusion to Yuxo, questioning why they couldn't just accept that they were led to discover this by God's providence, regardless of the precise location matching. Each objection around the secret site was met with a counterpoint. 
The desperate quest to pinpoint the remnants also triggered unfortunate incidents. Wealthy adventurer Brock Lancaster sunk huge fortunes into reckless solo climbing attempts to find what he dubbed Noah's true resting place. After mysteriously disappearing mid-expedition, search crews found only his abandoned gear sheltering human remains. The gruesome outcome only perpetuated Ararat's infamous reputation. Through it all, Dr. Yuxel's team held steady against pressure to freely provide their precious site coordinates. Yuxel promised that when the time is appropriate, they will guide dedicated researchers there. For now, further scientific study is vital before risking contamination. As debates flared about localization assumptions, the place where an apparent man-made relic matching Genesis details lay frozen would remain confidential, an explosive secret protected from future revelation. When God warns righteous Noah of plans to flood the corrupt world, divine instruction to build a vast life-saving ark spawns an enduring saga of belief versus doubt that resonates through Jewish, Christian, and Islamic faiths for millennia. Let's hear the story, the biblical and Quranic accounts of Noah's Ark. The story of Noah's Ark is one of the most captivating tales that cuts across several major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. For centuries, the dramatic account of the great flood that swept the earth and Noah's divinely inspired construction of a giant vessel of salvation has left imaginations stirred and questions swirling. The earliest mention of Noah's watery adventure can be found in the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible. As the biblical story goes, God was profoundly distressed by just how immoral and corrupt humanity had become in that age. People turned their backs on their creator, violating codes of ethical conduct at every step and generally being downright nasty to each other. Massive chaos reigned. So God made a call that still packs an emotional punch today. The civilization would need to be power washed and rebooted. Amidst all the wicked souls walking the earth during this time, one man, Noah, stood out as righteous and blameless before God. When the Creator shared the cataclysmic plan for an epic flood designed to wipe the slate clean and try humanity again with Noah, he instructed him to get to work on building a massive boat that could house Noah's family and a male and female of every kind of living creature. Following God's exact blueprint, Noah constructed a three-level wooden behemoth that was 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. In modern measurements, the ark is generally accepted to have been around 437 feet long, 73 feet wide, and 44 feet high. Even by today's shipbuilding standards, Noah was tasked with creating a mind-bogglingly gigantic ocean-worthy vessel using available materials and technology centuries before the glory days of ancient Egypt. As described in Genesis, God provided Noah with exceptionally detailed instructions on how to construct what was essentially the world's first floating zoo. The three-story ark was designed to have rows upon rows of rooms with beasts on the bottom level, humans in the middle, and birds up top. It was to be sealed inside and out with pitch to make it completely waterproof. There was to be an 18-inch opening running around the perimeter of the top deck, and a large door was set into the side. As incredulous as it all seemed, Noah did not buckle under the weight of it all. He had total faith that if God commanded such a challenging feat with the expectation that a catastrophic flood was imminent, he would find a way. Noah assembled his three sons, wives, and sons' wives and gave them their marching orders to get the materials and start building. Scripture notes that the enormous project took around 75 to 100 years to complete. In that time, as Noah and his family sawed, hammered, and hoisted, his neighbors mocked and chided them for dedicating their lives to such a preposterous task. How could there possibly be enough water in the world to flood the entire planet? But Noah kept calm and carried on until God gave the word it was time to start loading creatures, great and small, through the ark's side entrance. Seven days after Noah, his relatives, and the animals were all safely inside, the floodgates opened. Literally, Torrents of rain poured from the heavens while colossal subterranean reservoirs burst open, shooting pillar-like jets of water miles into the atmosphere. For 40 nail-biting days and nights, the precipitation continued relentlessly. Before long, even the loftiest mountains were submerged under almost 30 feet of water. Life on land had been completely extinguished.
The entire earth had become a deep briny sea with the newly completed Ark as the sole refuge keeping a remnant population of mankind and beast kingdom alive. Inside, Noah, his family, and all the creatures rode out the storm for five long months before the violent tempest finally calmed and the water level steadily receded. Grounding atop one of the peaks of the Ararat mountain range between modern-day Turkey and Armenia, the dazed passengers emerged from the Ark as the new ancestral fathers and mothers of humanity. In the Muslim tradition based on passages in the Quran, Noah went on to become revered as the second Adam and lived for another 350 years after his feet touched dry land again. The Quran, the central Islamic holy text, contains more than 100 verses centered on Noah. However, in Arabic, he is referred to as Nu rather than the traditional English translation of the biblical name. The Islamic depiction of Nu aligns closely with the Genesis narrative with a few variations, chiefly the assertion that Nu and his companions floated in the ark for closer to six months. The Quran also illustrates Nu repeatedly appealing to God about the folly of his wicked neighbors before eventually agreeing that they were too far gone for an intervention to make any difference. The holy books of all three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism with the Torah, Christianity via the Bible's Old Testament, and Islam through passages in the Quran, cement the enduring legacy of Prophet Nu Noah. Though millennia have passed, the account of a faithful servant of God building the impossible at the Creator's command to rescue the purest of life on earth continues to capture hearts, imaginations, and headlines today. For as many unanswered questions as there are surrounding the veracity of the Great Flood and the real fate of that history-altering, ocean-going vessel, one universal truth persists from Noah's white-knuckle voyage. With sufficient faith, all storms can be weathered. When God burdens devoted Noah with building a massive lifeboat for land creatures based on cryptic instructions, it spawns electrifying theories from scholars reconciling perplexing logistics like cargo tons, animal space needs, and even waste removal for the lengthy tempest. Puzzling details and practicalities of the Ark. As unfathomable as the epic of Noah's Ark may seem, visionary thinkers throughout history from varied backgrounds Theologians, mathematicians, naval engineers, and more have attempted to make sense of the mind-boggling practical challenges of Noah's divine assignment. How could such a small group construct a ship over four football fields in length using Bronze Age tools? What kept thousands of wild animals from stampeding in close quarters for months? Did ancient Israelites truly grasp shipbuilding on a scale to create an ocean-worthy vessel longer than the Titanic? Questions swirl but theories and clues continue to arise that lend credibility to aspects of this biblical vessel that captured imaginations for millennia. While scant details on day-to-day -day life aboard the massive lifeboat survive, Genesis describes Noah receiving shockingly precise instructions directly from the Creator on the raw construction specs for the three-story wooden behemoth. Relying on the common cubit measurement of the era derived from the length of a man's forearm from elbow to fingertip, God commanded the following estimated dimensions. Length, 300 cubits or approximately 450 feet. Width, 50 cubits or 75 feet. Height, 30 cubits or 45 feet. Additionally, the ark was to consist of three decks divided into chambers and a sohar. The Hebrew term sohar has perplexed scholars for ages. Some contend it refers to narrow openings just below the roof to allow natural light in not unlike what historic naval architects devised to keep cargo dry, but lit. More liberal interpretations suggest it could have been a retractable roof or canopy structure built from an ancient world marvel material called gopher wood, mentioned for its use in the Ark's construction in Genesis. By analyzing these details alongside advanced digital modeling, nautical enthusiast Tim Lovett argues that Noah's Ark could have been built to be completely watertight. His theory challenges the popular image of the Ark as a bulky cargo barge. Drawing on evidence of shipbuilding techniques from the Bronze Age, Lovett suggests that a sleeker design would have been more practical for navigating rough waters. This design included gradually narrowing floors and outward-leaning walls to provide structural stability and direct waves away from the vessel. In his essay, Could Noah's Ark Float? Lovett further explores how the Ark's stability in the ocean likely relied on a ballasted keel 
commonly used in medieval ships. This heavy mass, typically made of stone or iron, would have counteracted the weight of the cargo and animals stored in the ark, ensuring it remained balanced in turbulent seas. Determining how the proposed inhabitants would be cared for using Bronze Age methods depends on interpretation. Literal depictions of animals in narrow rows of boxes akin to modern stables or kennels raise concerns about the feasibility of extended oceanic journeys without modern ventilation or sanitation. However, theorists like Lovett argue that some practical flexibility should be allowed considering the divine nature of the structure. If the animals were curated at a manageable population size and housed in habitats resembling natural settings, meeting their daily feeding needs would present challenges. Storing enough diverse food for roughly 420 days, including meats, fish, grains, grasses, and fruits, is a daunting task before considering water requirements. In the 1970s, creationist author Henry M. Morris proposed theories on fulfilling these needs in his book, Noah's Ark, a feasibility study. One scenario involved packs of proto-dogs assisting shepherds like Noah's family in hunting large beasts, while smaller creatures subsisted on grains and gathered edibles. Alternatively, Morris suggested that God could have performed another miracle by inducing hibernation in the animals or directly sustaining them supernaturally during the year-long voyage. In terms of operational logistics, historians imagine a certain hierarchy under Noah's leadership, resembling the nautical chain of command still used today. As the captain of the voyage, Noah assessed conditions, ensured there were enough provisions, and made decisions regarding balance and seaworthiness. His sons and daughters-in-law were in charge of designated deck crews, responsible for tasks like feeding the animals, waste removal and maintenance such as fixing leaks and cleaning. Because of the ark's immense size, navigation and course corrections likely happened slowly and gradually using collaborative efforts like heaving, pushing, or steering oars around the exterior, rather than quick maneuvers like smaller dinghies. Experts think the movement mechanics were similar to those used for Egyptian royal funeral barges constructed centuries later for transporting large monuments. Figuring out practical solutions to challenges like waste management, ventilation, lighting, and balancing the immense weight of the ark continues to spark lively debates among religious scholars, scientists, and historians. Most agree that certain fantastical elements, like the futuristic sounding construction materials and the ark's mammoth carrying capacity, can be interpreted symbolically rather than taken literally. This allows for a clearer focus on the moral significance and implications of the great flood story, instead of getting bogged down in debates about ancient technicalities. At its heart, Noah's journey symbolizes the ultimate trial and triumph of faith and unwavering obedience. Since no historical evidence has been universally accepted by all, the decision to believe in the scriptural account of a man who followed divine orders in a skeptical world remains a matter of personal conviction. For those who share Noah's belief, no additional proof is needed. The Ark stands as a timeless symbol of salvation and fresh starts through challenges, showing that God can guide those who trust in Him safely through life's most turbulent storms. Like this video and subscribe for more exciting videos. Also, drop your movie suggestions in the comments below.